what? Today, you learn how to go from this loser to this gigabrain intellectual using dynamic programming. So what is dynamic programming? Dynamic programming, or DP for short, is all about making things go fast. Just like how you hate waiting in queue to lose another game of ranked solo duo and you hate waiting for your roommate to finish shitting, coders hate waiting for slow code. Speed is key. We want to go fast. We can use software to go fast. Algos is fast software and finally DP is a type of algo. DP is really good for solving some problems, but not so good for solving other problems. That's why we have a bunch of other algos, data structures, and hardware optimizations to help with other things. According to Google, DP is defined as... That's way too long. DP is really just two key parts. The results are saved and subproblems. Saving results in CompSci is called memoization, and it is really easy. All it means is to take some computation and store it so we don't have to make that computation again. Instead of going to the library every time to read books, we spend 500 bucks on a bookshelf and go to the library once and keep a bunch of books with us at home. There are two reasons why we use a bookshelf here. Our bookshelf is easy and fast access. Now you don't have to run over to the library and back every time you want to read that same book. You have improved your own runtime. Most importantly, we know that we will want to retrieve the book later down the line. We would never keep something close by if we didn't want to use it again later. A computer's bookshelf is often an array or map where items can be accessed in O of 1. This is where previously used books or previously computed outputs are saved and stored to be used for later. How do you make this delicious plate of chicken pesto pasta? We solve the subproblems. We solve pesto, chicken, and so on. To get pesto, we would need to solve pesto first, so we get the ingredients of pesto. By solving all the subproblems, we build them together to solve the larger problem that is making chicken pesto pasta. Like in cooking, we want to find a subproblem such that there exists a natural or convenient relationship, or what programmers and mathematicians call a recurrence relation, from a smaller subproblem to a larger subproblem, all the way up to our final solution. Once we discover the recurrence relation, the DP solution becomes very clear. Finding the appropriate recurrence relation is the hard part. The most common recurrence relation is found in the Fibonacci sequence. We call this a recurrence relation because we describe a relationship between a larger subproblem f sub n in terms of the smaller subproblems f sub n minus 1 and f sub n minus 2. Note that recurrence relationships can often have much more complicated relationships, like taking the min max or the summation of many subproblems. But we'll see that these complicated relationships can still be formulaically deduced. This problem is called longest increasing subsequence, or LIS, and is fairly common to run into when learning dynamic programming. Take a few minutes and ask yourself, what is the recurrence relation here? What solution to a subproblem flows nicely from one subproblem to a bigger subproblem? Now let's build intuition for solving. Let's start with framing our subproblem. Naturally, we could try solving for the subarray of the larger array. This being the case, we could frame our subproblem as f of 0 and j, where f of 0 and j represents the length of the LIS within just the 0 to j subarray. For example, f of 0 to 3 would be equal to 2. Let's try to build a recurrence relation from f of 0 and j. The question we now want to ask ourselves is can we build a relationship between the larger subproblems and the smaller subproblems? In other words, can we express f of 0 and 5 in terms of f of 0 and 4 in all the smaller evaluations of f? Turns out we can't because we don't know how the next value 9 compares with the largest value of the subsequence in the smaller evaluations. We'd want to compare 9 with 4, 3, 2, and 3 but we have no way of knowing to compare with these values if all we store are the following subproblems. For all our computer knows, the subsequence could be the first x elements of the subarray. It could be the last x elements. It could be anything. Therefore, we need a new subproblem. We notice that we need to store more information. Whenever we need to store more information or different information, we should change our subproblem's parameters. Here, what new parameter helps us? We need to know the value of the largest or rightmost element that is part of the longest subsequence in our previous subproblems. And we can achieve this by enforcing that an element at index k must be the last element in each subproblem. We add k as a new parameter to our subproblem. We now simplify f of 0, j, and k. We remove the first parameter because it is fixed. We never really needed to have it there in the first place. We remove j because there is no point of having both j and k. Our subsequence is guaranteed to end at k, meaning an ending index of the subarray is pointless when j is greater than k, hence our fully flushed out subproblem. 
Just like before, consider the relationship between the larger subproblem and the smaller subproblems. Notice that the optimal longest subsequence of f of k can be and must be built from one of the subproblems. Therefore, we come to our final recurrence relationship. Note that f of x just represents the smaller subproblem. Of course, we only consider a smaller subproblem if the array at k is greater than the array at x, as this indicates that the new rightmost element is larger than the largest element from before. The base case of the recurrence relation naturally follows. After we have solved for all values of f of k, where k ranges from 0 to the end of the input array, the largest f of k represents the LIS of the entire array, which is our desired answer. The runtime of DP algorithms is usually hella easy to calculate. It's just this, which is equal to this, and applies universally. Let's say for LIS we are given an array of length n. The number of subproblems in LIS is n, and the runtime to solve each subproblem is the same as the runtime to resolve a single recurrence relation. In the recurrence relation, we iterate through k values, so the runtime to solve each subproblem is also n. The runtime of our DP approach to LIS is therefore O of n squared. Congrats! You just created your first DP solution. But how about other problems? The good thing is, you can approach almost all DP problems with the intuition provided earlier. That includes for solving problems whose recurrence relations look like this. Losers are often super scared of higher dimensional DP, saying stuff like, ah, 2D DP is so scary, or oh my god, a 2D grid, or the knapsack problem is too hard. Notice that here, there are four parameters to this recurrence relationship, indicating that this is 4D DP. Whenever we use our trick to add a new parameter, we are going up a dimension. Higher dimension DP is not hard at all, it's just adding new parameters. You probably won't change the world with this stuff, but hey, it's pretty fucking cool. It may even land you a dream job at Google or Jane Street, or whichever corporate entity you want to suffer at. You could even try to teach grandma about it. She would really appreciate this stuff. While you're at it, maybe even get her a grokking the system design interview book. Now before you hop back into a Valorant game just to go 2 and 14 on raise, here's a recap of what you just learned. So this is everything DP. Take a look at it yourself. I don't feel like saying it all. I hope you learned something, and if not, no worries. Don't be stressing. Thanks for watching, and see you all later.